Panic at the disco's short journey from high school students to stars in the space of just over a year has resulted in a platinum selling debut album, sold out world tours and millions of fans. Born and bred in Las Vegas, Nevada, the band has brought a touch of glamour back to the music scene with spectacular shows and a unique sound. But behind the seemingly overnight success is a story of dedicated musicians, golden opportunities and an internet revolution. This is the story so far of Panic at the Disco. The story of Panic at the Disco begins in Las Vegas in 2004, when Brent Wilson, Brendan Yuri, Ryan Ross, and Spencer Smith were barely in their teens. A difficult age to be in a 24-hour city like Las Vegas, where the available entertainment is strictly adults only. Growing up in Vegas, it, uh, it numbs you, because you get used to seeing the things that a lot of people don't ever, don't ever see. Like, Drugs, alcohol, strippers, <laughs> you know what I mean? Things that a lot of people just don't see until they're adults, you see consistently throughout your entire life. I think anyone who grew up in, in this town um, is going to have stories for the rest of their life. Vegas is kind of a place where you have to have self-control. You know, I would imagine it's a really tough place to raise kids. There are so many distractions, there are so many ways for them to get into trouble. So growing up in Vegas, there really isn't much to do. When you're 16, you often find yourself like I did either blowing stuff up, doing drugs, or uh, in our case, doing music. The lack of all ages venues in Las Vegas means that for those under 21, there is little choice of places to hang out in the city, especially when it comes to seeing live music. If you're not old enough to drink and to gamble, a lot of the venues would rather ignore you and welcome clientele that can make them quick money. It's really difficult for these big venues that are inside of casinos to cater to these young kids because they've got to pass through casinos, which is technically not legal for them to be alone. I've seen shows at smoothie places and parking lots, um, really improvised kind of stuff. It is a punk rock ethic and it has its roots in, you know, do it, doing it yourself. <laughs> Brent Wilson and Ryan Ross met at Bishop Gorman High School in 2004. Along with Ryan's childhood friend Spencer Smith, the trio began to practice their instruments together and ideas turned to forming a band. Ex-bass player Brent Wilson describes those early days. I started listening to like Blink-182 and Third Eye Blind, just wanting to play those songs and so I'd learn their songs on guitar and then Gradually, me and Ryan and Spencer, what we do is we just play those songs together. And eventually, once that's, bit, that's how we learned how to play our instruments. And then once we were able to actually <laughs> play a song all the way through together, we'd try to write songs. And we'd just play in the garage and mess around. And it, it was just basically three friends hanging out, playing music. The first band that we were in was Pat Salamander and we didn't record anything, so it wasn't really even a band. Uh, and same with the Summer League, we didn't really record anything except for like four really scratchy demos that weren't even finished, so yeah. They weren't even really technically bands, they were kind of just, you know, like what kids say in high school, yeah, dude, I'm in this band. <laughs> that was all the way up until my uh, junior year in high school when I met Brennan. And, that's when Panic at the Disco started. We had to learn a Beatles song one day in guitar class. We were just, we were just messing around playing, and um, he saw that I was sitting by myself. And Brennan, you know, he's this really wild, like really outgoing kid, and he invited me to come over and just hang out with him. And then we had those four really crappy demos that I was talking about that I presented to Brennan, and he was into it at the time, and so. He, I introduced them to Ryan and Spencer, and that's when we started practicing together and the band started. Although no one could have predicted the events of the next year, there were early signs of ambition. I was at a friend's house one day, and uh, I was just flipping through some of the books on his shelf, and he had a yearbook from Bishop Gorman High School, 
and uh, I had I'd known that one of the members from Panic at the Disco had gone there, so uh, I was flipping through the yearbook and I actually found uh, Ryan Ross's picture in the yearbook. Um, it was he was a senior in, in 2004 at, at this high school. It's actually on one of the the senior pages of the yearbook that says, "In 10 years, I'll become." Um, a musician or an author or a writer and uh, for Ryan Ross right over here there's another picture of him holding an old guitar and it says musician so uh, in 10 years I'll become a musician according to Ryan Ross but it turned out it was really more uh, more like one year in high school Ryan was actually pretty shy and you know not he wasn't that outgoing Spencer was outgoing he was gonna he, Spencer is a smart kid and he but he was you know like a little troublemaker in class, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, I was always I always like Spencer a lot. He's a he's a good guy. I remember Brendan. He came into German One when he would have been a sophomore. He was real quiet for the first few weeks, uh, and then slowly but surely his personality began to come out. And he was real outgoing, kind of eccentric. A lot of people thought he was. Uh, I think his humor was not suited to be a sophomore. He had a slightly more of an adult sense of humor. So he would have been about 14, 15 years old. And then he was my aide for a year. And that's when I really got to know him probably the best, when he was my student aide. While officially he's meant to grade papers, go get my mail, stuff like that. Uh, he, as I remember, he, uh, he watched DVDs and checked his own MySpace account to see how many hits he'd had. What is this? Panic at the Disco took their name from a line in the song Panic by the band Name Taken and rented a practice space where they could concentrate on putting songs together. Kenny James runs TK Productions. I think it was Ryan and Spencer and uh, Brendan. Uh, they, they wanted a rehearsal studio here. They moved in. My partner looked at me and he's like, uh, they look pretty young. You, you might want to check some IDs on that because you usually have to be 18 to, you know, to sign a contract in the, in the States here. So one of their parents had to sign for, for the lease. I met him at that door and we walked down. We came down and then this was the room I had available. This is right when we first opened up, so. And this was their first room that they moved into. This is where they started working on their music. They came in here a lot. I mean, they were here pretty much every day, it seemed like to me. I saw them all hours of the night. And uh, I would say like, you know, they say overnight success, but they were here a lot of overnights. Every once in a while you stop by a door, and I used to stop by theirs every once in a while and be like, that sounds kind of cool, you know? Panic were savvy enough to recognize the early potential of MySpace and set up an account for Panic at the Disco in December 2004. They never really had a demo that I know of. They didn't have like an 8x10, like remember in the day where you used to have the promo pack and like all that stuff, everything's just electronic now on, on MySpace and, and you know where you can meet you could get to a lot more fans too nationwide you know worldwide that you could never have gotten before. It was Brendan's idea I think to set up that MySpace account he was fascinated with it the whole year he always checked how many hits he had and I think that's really what gave them their huge break because um, he, as far as I know he was one of the few bands that did that and I think he was overwhelmed with how many people were listening to it. And that was when MySpace was really starting to flourish. And um, I think that, that gave them their ticket to get noticed by a lot of people. We recorded those original songs, the very first one, Time to Dance, on a $900 laptop. I checked their MySpace and they had one little song and, you know, a hundred friends or so. And uh, one little picture of them that was taken at a place I recognized in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, I checked them out, checked out the song, and I, I put the two together with Pet Salamander from, from there. And uh, that was the first time that I actually heard the, the very first song that they demoed. Um, that was the song that got posted on the right live journal and went to the right people in Fall Out Boy. Pete Wentz of Fall Out Boy set up the record label Decadence in 2005 in connection with Fueled by Ramen Records. Panic at the Disco were big fans of Fall Out Boy, so Pete's web blog was their first port of call. Ryan hosted a, a link on 
Pete's live journal, I think it was. For whatever reason, Pete listened to it. I think it was because he said he liked the name or something random like that. And he instant messaged Ryan the next day, and we thought it was a joke. We, we thought someone was pranking us, and there's no way it could be true. And about a week later, he came out and watched his practice. And honestly, like right from that point, he signed us. It was like we had only written two songs. So that was also a lot of added pressure because we didn't know how to write songs. Like we, writ we, we, we wrote two songs that were terrible <laughs> in our opinions and like we didn't even know what direction we were going in. It was good having him when we were, when we were first starting up because you know, he, he was part of the label but it was great to have someone that was actually in a band helping you out because you know, he, knows, he knows the road. You know, he can show you the ropes and how you know how it works. What what's a business smart and what isn't? And I, Pete is very business smart as far in music. I think he's one of the most business smart people out there. So it was really awesome to have him to show us the you know what to do, how to how to use our money and our time and all of that. After Panic at the Disco signed to Decadence. Many from the Vegas music scene became aware of them for the first time. The hits on MySpace increased, and the band began to attract attention. I became aware of Panic at the Disco shortly after they were announced that they were signed. I was on a local website called the Airbag. It's a local scene-store website. It said, Panic at the Disco local band signed to Decadance, home of Fall Out Boy. And at first, I was enraged, because I, like a lot of the other people in the scene, were like, I've never heard of this band, I've never seen them play, and they're already signed to a major label. What's up with this? You know, I became aware of them first when I went to Texas, I was on tour, and this boy comes up to me in another band, he says, hey, have you heard of Panic of the Disco? They're from your city. And I was like, I, I know everything about my city as the music scene goes, I've never heard of them, I have no idea who they are. And he showed me a song, and he's like, listen, they're great. So I listened to it, and I was like, wow, like, where did these guys come from? Where, where are they? I haven't even seen them. And uh, he says, well, you know, I've been, here, I've been listening to them. They're really great. Came back, still didn't really hear anything. And then all of a sudden, a month later, it was all over the place. All of a sudden, I could not, they could not be denied. There was, all of a sudden, there was five songs on MySpace, and they were getting, you know, 100,000 plus plays a day. And it was just insane. We had no idea that that was going to happen, that we would get signed. It was always something that we, we dreamed of doing. We always played music, like I said, from junior high on. But... Like every kid, you know, they have a dream. I want to be a baseball player, I want to be a football player, or whatever. They don't think it's actually going to happen, or I don't think they do. I didn't. <laughs> it was amazing. It was a complete shock, and it was one of the most thrilling moments, you know, finding out that you're going to be able to do what you've always wanted to do. It, it was definitely unusual to hear of something that instant happening, and Fueled by Ramen, definitely an up-and-coming label, with, with Fall Out Boy being the, the kingpin there. Um, and just having, being able to hear that, you know, through the internet and through just finding the right sources, um, that something like that, that amazing could happen to a band. We were aware that we had too much of a fan base for how much we released. It was kind of freaking us out that, we, you know, we had so many people listening to us on pure volume on these two demos that we hated because we didn't want to be known by that, but at the same time, people were liking it, so it's like, we didn't want to just erase it because we, you know, we, we were writing, we wanted our name out there. Word spread that Panic at the Disco had been signed to a label without having played a single gig. Some Las Vegas bands weren't impressed. Their problem was, I guess, was the way that we got signed because we didn't pay our dues. We didn't go on tour for however many months or whatever they wanted us to do, whatever, you know, it's in contract that a band is supposed to do to get big. Sorry for my sarcasm, but yeah, um, we always kind of thought it was smarter to write songs than write three songs and go play shows. We always wanted to progress in our, our songwriting and become better musicians. There was a big backlash in Vegas from the local bands who've had to play the, you know, the bars that hold 50 people at 3 a.m. and then get paid in beer and then have to clean up afterwards. And um, that made the papers a lot when they first came out. And I talked to him a little bit about it. 
And to be perfectly honest, you know, what's he meant to do? You know, he's, it would be impossible for him to turn around and say, oh, you know what, let's not play the Orleans today. Let's go play the, you know, Senor Frogs on Trop and Valley View. Exactly. Who who is gonna? Is gonna oh, here's here's a record deal. Oh no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sign that because I haven't gone on tour yet. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take the opportunity to do what I wanted to do my entire life because you know, I haven't paid my dues. With only two songs completed, the band now had practically an entire album to write. All four members were still in full-time education. So they stayed in Las Vegas and moved into a larger rehearsal room. This was right before um, when they told me they were going to go to Maryland and, and work on their album. This is where they were doing a lot of the practicing. You know, this is a great place where you can, like I said, it's 24-7, where you can just come in here and be creative. And there's not that many places where you can, you know, play the drums at 3 o'clock in the morning. We were writing a record that was for an actual record label, but we're practicing next to like these heavy metal bands next door that are blaring <laughs> this music and we're trying to write our record and can't focus because we have people covering Disturbed songs like right next to us. I do remember the door being open a couple times though and, and they had switched instruments. They were playing each other's instruments, kind of having a good time in there. And they were all, they could all play each other's instruments kind of, you know. Brendan, um, he's a good drummer. Panic at the Disco traveled to Maryland in June 2005 to record their debut album with up-and-coming producer Matt Squire. Recording A Fever You Can't Sweat Out with Matt Squire was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Matt Squire is, he's a great guy. The first day you meet him, he becomes your best friend. He's, he's the easiest guy to get along with. And like, I have to say that we had uh, I think it was $10,000 recording budget and Matt Squire <laughs> made that record sound like we had a $150,000 recording budget and I don't know very many other producers that could do that and also like pre-production I can't even say how much he helped us structure those songs and you know turn them into real songs and give us a direction and you know, because we, we went in there with, you know, five solid songs, but then we had a, other songs that were just kind of pieces, and he would help us out putting them together, and, you know, that guy is, he's a genius, he really is. It was amazing, it was a dream come true, it was the most pressure that you ever had in your life, more than, like, any final exam or anything like that, you know, because it, this is, like, your career, and especially when you're taking on your career at 17 years old, um, being far from home, that was that was difficult because, especially the situation that we were in, we were in Maryland, and the part of Maryland that we were in, we was not a very good place. We we stayed in a studio that all it was is a floor, four mattresses, and spiders. <laughs> That's it. Uh, a toilet that worked half the time, and a shower that worked half the time, and the dumpster said "crypt" and blood on it. But I think, you know, it turned all of us, I think, it might sound lame to say, but more into men. We, we grew up because, you know, we're on our own, living in the ghetto and writing our own music and doing our own thing. You know, it's, it's a business. And so, I don't know, I think, it, I think it's a great experience. At the same time, you know, you're living with the three, three of the same people all the time, every day. You get annoyed with each other. It's just natural. It was only during the recording of A Fever You Can't Sweat Out that the band really formed the unique Panic at the Disco sound. I guess you would say we matured a lot in our musical taste. In the first few songs that we wrote, we wrote in a phase that we were rapidly changing what we were listening to. And once we got later into the recording and writing the songs, you know, we were getting into like the sixth song. We didn't even like the first five songs that we wrote, you know which are the first, basically the first few songs off the record, the ones with the synth and, and like kind of the dance influence. That music, we didn't, we wish we could just scrap that part of the record, have the last half and write five or six new songs, but 
unfortunately at that time it was our first record and you know you have a lot of pressure to release it we wanted to make it a really more like a production you know like a like an orchestra with a, maybe rock music influence like a rock bass behind it but more orchestrated and more organic than than you know pop influenced and synthesizers and uh, like the futuristic sound genre wise they've managed to put themselves in a unique place I would say they're more like kind of like electro pop electro post pop or something like that they're emotional in a lot of ways their songs are very you know hinge on depression girls you know and the metaphysical nature around that so yeah I guess you can find emo in there, but most music has emo elements in it right now anyway. While writing material for the album, a process that the band found difficult at first, Ryan Ross emerged as the driving force behind most of the songwriting. At the beginning, we would write, we would all be together and we would write music together and then Ryan would scrap together lyrics. Um, at the end, the way that we prefer songwriting and the way that we think that the better songs turned out was when Ryan would write lyrics first because that would kind of set a mode, you know, set a tone for how we wanted the music to sound. And so he'd write lyrics and then he'd present them to us. And usually Ryan would, he would write like the first part of music, whatever it was. If it, usually it would be a guitar part. And then he'd bring in a guitar part and all four of us would come in and do whatever we could do to elaborate on that and make it, turn it into a song. As time went on, we, you know, Ryan would be able to come up with things quicker, therefore we'd be able to all work together and, you know, kind of jam, jam it out and, and see what, what, what sounds good, which, which notes work together. And Ryan's lyrics are, you know, incredibly sophisticated and it's amazing how they were able to put it together in such a manner where people can be oblivious to the fact that what he's actually saying is that intelligent. Because you can sing along with it and not have any idea of what that's to, that you're actually, you know, you know, it's poetry basically. It's very intelligent poetry put into a very catchy song form. Once Panic had finished recording their debut album, they were immediately booked in a support slot on a nationwide tour. With less than two weeks to prepare and the pressure building, the band returned to Las Vegas. Straight from recording the album, we drove to Las Vegas without one stop other than gas. We didn't sleep. We looked like we had taken every drug known to man, and we were drinking Red Bull the entire, the entire time, just trying to stay awake. It was, it was insane. We were, by the time we got home, we were puking and. We, and then what was really ridiculous was right when we got home, we, we got to Ryan's house and we had to listen to our record, the mix. And within one hour, we had to let them know if the mix for the record was okay. We were home for two weeks and that's the only time we had to prepare for our first tour around the United States. At that point, we hadn't had one actual band practice, so we had I think 11 days to prepare for a tour. Panic played a warm-up show at a popular Las Vegas all-ages venue called The Alley. This was their first ever live gig. I was uh, doing a promotion, doing some promotion over at The Alley, which is an all-ages venue um, in the back of a music store. It's a great place, really cool place. And the kids were talking about this band and I had never heard of them. I thought it was a great name. The name was fantastic. And I hear all these kids talking about this band and come to find out they're a Vegas band. Oh, is that the one band with that, that one little song? Like, they're, they're big already? Like, what, what are you talking about? So I checked it out because I'm always down for, you know, a show that I have a ticket to. I came and I was surprised because I'd never seen that many people at a show there before. The alley is only supposed to fit 300 people and they ended up letting 500 kids in because there were like so like hundreds of kids waiting that couldn't get tickets so they overloaded the place and like everyone I think almost died of heat exhaustion they, they had their complete set you know all the songs that made the album uh, even though just a few months before they only had the one song on the MySpace but all the songs came together really quickly and really well you couldn't even hear Brendan you know the, the crowd reacted at the gig just you know unbelievable it was 
You just heard them singing. <laughs> you didn't even hear him sing. It was it was a lot of fun. It was amazing. We had several mess ups, but no one cared, and it was a great time. They already had merchandise printed, um, like T-shirts and, and everything printed for um, for everything for sale. And I was, geez, this band is is right on top of it. How did they? How did this happen? I was a little skeptical, but you know there was a, a certain something there that you could tell was was going somewhere. <laughs> Supporting established Seattle band, Acceptance, Panic found themselves playing to large audiences and winning fans in every city. Our first tour, we opened up for Acceptance, and at that point, they had, they actually had a following. They had, they had, you know, they were, they were a pretty known band at that point. We didn't have a following, but, you know, people would listen to us because they were there to see Acceptance. And, so there, you know, there were probably 300 to 500 people there. So it was amazing for us to have that kind of exposure on our first tour. We were really, really spoiled, to be honest. Like we got really lucky with everything. Every time I would talk to them, there was another step that they had gone to. You know, they had gone to LA. They were playing the Troubadour. Next thing I knew, they were told me they were playing Jimmy Kimmel. Next thing they were on tour. Next thing they were going to Europe. I mean. Just every time I would talk to them, there was just another step that they had taken, which was just amazing. A Fever You Can't Sweat Out was released in the US in September 2005. The album release coincided with Panic's next tour, this time supporting Fall Out Boy. Panic Fever was about to grip the nation. The biggest transition, to be honest, wasn't going to headlining, it was going from opening to acceptance to opening for Fall Out Boy because at that point we were playing in front of five, ten thousand people because we were opening for Fall Out Boy. It's almost like the more people there are into your music, the more comfortable you are. Like I feel comfortable, I'd feel comfortable now playing in front of 20,000 people than I would a hundred, you know, because you just get that vibe. It feels great to see people. You know, really feeling that your music and understanding it. The moment the first gig they ever played with Fall Out Boy, there were CDs on the sale for merch for the crowd. And so that was incredibly smart. And that really worked out for them. Because then the whole time they were with Fall Out Boy, there were CDs being promoted through Fall Out Boy. Because if Pete gets up on stage or any of the guys from Fall Out Boy and says, buy Panic at the Disco CD, it's over. The millions of kids will follow you know, follow suit. I remember the local Best Buy, which is uh, sells CDs. Uh, they released his album, and I seem to recall students coming in every day saying they're sold out, they're sold out, they're sold out. And I kept thinking to myself, okay, well that's fine. You know, obviously a lot of kids from this area are buying it. You know, that's that's to be expected. And then they got in 10,000 copies, and all of a sudden they'd be sold out the next day. And it would be on the radio every single day, and it would be in restaurants playing, and it would be everywhere. <laughs> Following the experience of two nationwide tours, Panic began to look seriously at their own image. They were introduced to video director Shane Drake, who'd worked with other fueled by ramen artists. From the beginning, you know, the two, two of the most outspoken guys were, it was of course, Ryan and Spencer. Um, it was clear that they were sort of the vocal points for the band at, the, at that point, you know, that uh, they definitely given a lot of thought to what they wanted to look like and what they didn't, more, you know, more specifically what they didn't want to look like and what they didn't want to be, you know, associated with. And, uh, and so, you know, they were very business, you know, they were very together, had their heads on straight. It was very uh, actually refreshing talking to them, having worked with so many independent bands that didn't know what the hell they wanted. It was clear from the first time we saw them play that they were a unique ba band with unique talent and that, you know, it was someone we wanted to be working with and as people they were very, considering how young they were, they were very concerned about a lot of details about their image. To me that's, that tells me they're an artist that care about, you know, what they're doing and realize this is a lifetime career, this is a, you know, something that is a holistic approach. Shane directed Panic's video for their debut single, I write sins, not tragedies. Basically, we we wrote the videos with Shane. We'd just sit there and we'd all be talking and come up with the craziest ideas and be like, we want fire and, we, you know, the most ridiculous, ambitious things we could come up with and somehow it worked. It was, I don't know, it was a lot of fun. That was one of the more fun parts of being in a band. They wanted an idea that tied into the lyrics 
but wasn't a, a literal translation. So, you know, obviously, you know, we're talking about a wedding and lyrics, but they don't, they didn't just want a video where there's a wedding, you know, obviously they wanted some sort of a spin on that. And so we must have had, a, you know, three or four ideas before we came up with this one that I can't for the life of me remember, but they all somehow revolved around a wedding or revolved around some aspect of a wedding that we tried to pull out of the real world and put into the surreal world. Let's really take this notion of two different families, two different histories, two different eccentricities, and make them both surreal. Only, not just surreal, but caricatures of the real. So, you know, you've got the bride side, which is definitely, you know, a surreal group of people with their faces painted, but you know, the eyes as though they're still open. But the idea is that they're caricaturizing a very stuffiness, a very conservative feel, um, but in a surreal way. Whereas then the groom side represents the more free spirit, crazy, eccentric type of family represented by a vaudevillian troupe. Based on the band's ideas, Shane contacted LA-based Lucent Dossier Vaudeville Cirque, who perfectly matched the image Panic at the Disco had in mind. This was the start of a long collaboration between the two. Dream Rockwell is the director of Lucent Dossier. We're a performance art circus troupe. We have a unique style that is kind of all our own. We do Mad Max kind of um, Venetian, Victorian style, haute couture clothing and then we do circus stunts and dance performances. The director sent us I Write Sins, Not Tragedies and I listened to the song and I was like wow okay this is really interesting like it brought back like kind of Queen I was like this is kind of like Queen or something but it was brand new and fresh at the same time. They wanted us just to bring, I think, six performers. I forget what it was, and I think we brought 17. And they wanted, um, you know, just traditional circus, but we showed up with some crazy bling and magic, and just, I think when Shane saw us, he was like, whoa, <laughs> great. <laughs> Making a video is so much harder than you would ever imagine, because you know, no matter what you're doing, if you know, if you're if you're shooting a scene where you're just standing there for however long you're sitting, you're doing those shots all day. The first time we were there, we were there for 16 hours. It was freezing, and we're all in these skimpy little outfits. I perform as well, so we're all in these skimpy little outfits. And the one like we had those wigs on. I had I had a pink wig on that day and we had those wigs on and it was like thank goodness for the wigs because they were like toques. They were like keeping our heads warm because it was so cold. And we just, you know, we would grab all these blankets and snuggle up and then when it would come to shoot we would pull them all off and we'd all act like, oh it's summertime and it's so beautiful and it was cold. Brendan in particular seemed to be the most inspired by Lucent Dossier. During the shoot, Brendan took everyone by surprise with his confident performance, and it was clear that he had grown into a star frontman. Brendan was very, uh, he was just very, you know, again, go with the flow, but also kind of zany. You could tell like he was, he was the charismatic one that wasn't necessarily, you know, the first decision maker, but definitely someone that was going to set the pace for how the band appeared and how how their energy was perceived. Because again, he's very much a frontman. He's very much a leader in, a, like I said, very uh, just energetic and charismatic. He was um, the more kind of spicy, you know, um, very. Uh, playful and he was he spent most of the day hanging out with us like every chance he could get he was kind of, him and Ryan were, were around us all day long I was really surprised at how confident and secure Brendan was on stage that that is what's rare a lot of musicians are used to being on a stage for a show but they're not used to being in front of a camera and you know it takes a few videos usually to get them used to that that notion and that feeling and that energy and he from the first take literally from the first take 
he was a star. I Write Sins, Not Tragedies, accompanied by Shane's video, was a huge hit with heavy MTV rotation and radio play. The band continued to tour relentlessly around America and enjoyed their first headlining tour in the UK, which included slots at the Leeds Reading Festival. But on the 17th of May, 2006, the shock news appeared on Panic at the Disco's website that Brent Wilson had left the band. One day at the office, we heard that Panic of the Disco had a separation with Brent Wilson. No one really knows why. He just kind of, they kind of said that he left. And uh, there were a lot of questions up there, what happened, and then suddenly they have the new touring basis. Their personalities did change a little bit. Everyone grew up a little bit more. Ryan wasn't as shy and everything. I think he got probably more confidence because of the band and everything, all that. And as far as now, I don't know Ryan or Brendan. Spencer's the only one that ever talks to me. So, yeah, I am, it's kind of sad, actually, the, the way that it's turned out, because they, I guess, don't want to be friends at all. He has left, and I know he initiated a lawsuit for royalties, that he was not being paid for the album, to which I believe Brandon Urie said that he really had no major influence in the musical or composition in the actual album. It kind of just goes to show you when the lawsuit happened, when they lost Brent, that this perfect band, these golden boys of the Las Vegas music scene, in a way, are human. They're real people, you know, they're a real band that has real problems. I mean, they seem perfect because they got signed without playing a show, but after they lose their basis, the basis they recorded with, the basis that they toured with initially, you know, everyone was like, oh, maybe they are a band, maybe they are real people. I had a great time doing it, it was fun. But now I'm gonna go to school and that'll, that'll work out too. Brent was replaced by Chicago-born John Walker, a longtime friend of the band. Well, they told me they had gotten rid of the bass player. And I was like, man, that's, you guys don't wanna do that. Just, you know, the hardest thing is to keep the original members together, you know? And, uh, but it doesn't seem like they missed a beat when they got the new, the new bass player. They chose him just intuitively because they really liked him and he works really well with them. They, there's great harmony amongst the, the group and he works really well in, inside that harmony. And I'd say his role is definitely comic relief. He's super funny and he's sweet too. He's great. Lots of bothers. Accompanied by Lucent Dossier, Panic set off on their first headlining world tour, and a fever you can't sweat out went platinum. I directed the performance aspect of the tour, so uh, just putting together the whole circus um, performance, I created all the costumes for the, for the dancers, and, um, and, and then I performed as well. So. And I, I, I did the infamous lap dance with, uh, with Brendan, which was actually supposed to be making fun of strippers and kind of um, showing it, the unglamorous side of it. And I actually heard some comments about it that young girls were like, oh, I want to be a stripper now because ugh, maybe I'll get to dance for Brendan. And I'm like, oh, that's not what it was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be the opposite of that. Panic began to incorporate more theatrical ideas into their shows, which set them apart from their contemporaries. They resurrected the age-old tradition of glamour in rock and roll. The whole idea of the band was supposed to be theatrical. Panic at the Disco was supposed to be not just a band it was, uh, that played a concert. We wanted it to be a show, and, you know, at first we didn't have any money to do that, so, you know, we had all these big ideas, but no money to do it. Their show being theatrical is definitely, would definitely have to be influenced by being in Vegas. Because everything here is completely over the top. You go to a show and it's not just, you know, you don't just go watch a play, you go watch this, you know, these hundred people doing circus acts and everyone's flying everywhere and there's explosions and there's pyrotechnics and everything here is glamorous, everything's over the top. And they did something that was really neat, they, you know, they made, they made a show, a rock show, a real rock show again. You know, you can't help but think if, you know, part of it's got to be the uh, uh, the Siegfried and Roy uh, influence, you know, or any of the other, 
you know, shows going on in town. You can't be as close to that kind of uh, theatrics on a regular basis and not, not absorb a little of it without even realizing it. You know, I mean, just the flash, the, the pizzazz, the glamour, just from driving down the street, it hits you, you know. I'm sure if they came out of any other market, if they came out of, um, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, um, they wouldn't have that same kind of vibe going on. It's still the suits. Like, a lot of bands have always done suits. The Beatles, the Killers did suits. Everybody does suits. They, I kind of like how they did it, though. They kind of just made it a little dirtier seeming, you know, kind of roughed it up a little bit and went back a little bit, not necessarily contemporary suits, but, you know, older, like the vast pocketbook type of top hats, whatnot. The image, I think, was actually really important to Panic because they, they had an image that nobody had really yet portrayed, and now a lot of people are trying to portray, portray that image. We wanted Panic at the Disco to be entertainment and not, not just simply about the music. They do have a lot of the 70s elements in them. Queen, I know I hear a lot of the doors, um, just because like a lot of these circusy type, you know, dance stuff going on, the piano and everything is very, very Jim Morris and very The Doors. And uh, I think the image was, went hand in hand with everything else, very much so. It's totally going back to, you know, glam, it's Bowie, it's, you know, Kiss, it's Motley Crue. I mean, it, it's totally, you know, an experience and in a way that image is kind of becoming essential in music because it's so flashy and so entertaining. The theatrics in rock and roll are kind of, I would say, something that's probably been long overdue for a while, but if not careful, could burn out pretty quickly, like it did with the initial glam explosion. And it was kind of neat to see a band that was actually even that young to bring back that element that you would normally see a band like, you know, the Rolling Stones or you know, U2 or something have this big you know, show on stage. It was neat that they were able to do that in their own, in, the, in their own image and in their own way. As Panic continued their sellout world tour, their popularity increased faster than anyone could have expected. The most fascinating thing about the tour for us was that as the tour was going on, they were just exploding. So we started off in venues that maybe had 500 people and by the end of the tour it was like thousands of people. I think the last venue was like 10,000 people or something. So it was, they had to keep switching venues as the tour was going on and getting venues with bigger capacities. And that's pretty exciting to be on a tour like that where you're going from relatively unknown to massive fame in the span of one tour. It just doesn't happen. I remember they went to House of Blues, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they played there and obviously it was packed from kids from school and their friends and word of mouth had spread. And then all of a sudden within a year they're playing the arena at the Orleans. And so, I mean, it was, I can't think of any bands since I've been following music that have exploded that quickly. The Orleans Arena, it's a, it's, as it says, arena, it's a, a larger venue than the alley. And I was completely surprised and blown away by them. Their show was really theatrical uh, with all these great props. And it looks kind of like, a, if I remember correctly, sort of like a music box sort of look to it. Panic gained a loyal and dedicated fan base all over the world. And interacting with the fans was very important to them. Those involved with the tour noticed how maturely they coped with the attention. After the shows, uh, the, the boys would, would be just, you know, they, they would be very, very calm and, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't jump into that whole rock and roll attitude of, of I'm this big rock and roll star. And, and uh, they had their separate bus and that was their quiet time. That was what they would do, whatever they, they do on, on the bus. And, and <clears throat> it was their sacred space in a way. I mean, they would invite people to go on the bus occasionally, but, um, but I, I felt that was a, a great way for them to just um, take the time and be themselves and, and not take uh, fame so seriously. I did six tours total, and two of them were in the United Kingdom, and those were the most fun. I loved them. Like, those were the best shows. The crowds were so enthusiastic. You'd show up, and like the kids would be lining up at your bus at like 6 o'clock in the morning, like, wanting to meet you and like it was just it was it was crazy we had never had such a warm welcome there and uh 
we played, we had that one tour in Japan, and that that was different because it, it's weird in Japan. The way they respond to the crowd is 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 much different than United States or the United Kingdom. There, what the way they do it is it's it's a respect thing. They don't make any noise. They don't clap. They don't cheer. They don't do anything. So like you feel like they are not into your music. You're kind of freaked out. So I think that's why I say the United Kingdom is the most fun because when you go there, you know kids are going insane. Like. You know, screaming, singing along every word, so it's a lot of fun there. The fans, oh my god, you've never seen such screaming fans. I mean, they're really crazy for Panic, I mean. And, you know, of course, they're adorable. Their music is great. They put on a great show, so, yeah. And they're so good with the fans, too. You know, the thing is, they really show up for the fans and give a lot to the fans. And we tried to do, you know, we did the same thing. We went out after every show and hung out with the kids. And it just really created so much life and fun and enthusiasm for the whole event, you know, they're not just a band, it's like an event, so, yeah, and the kids would just be like, ah! and boys and girls, you know, like across the board, everyone loves them. Maybe f five or ten dates into the tour, we looked out in the audience and we started to see audience members with their faces painted like us, and in the, be yeah, it was beautiful, it was amazing, and I remember the first time it happened, I was just like, oh! Like, I, the first time I saw a face out there, like, totally painted like ours, I was like, oh. And at the time, I was painting Ryan's face every night. I, I Originally, I did his makeup every night for him. And then, um, he's just an incredible artist, so he grabbed onto it himself. And actually, when we came back around, and I think we played, I forget, we played somewhere, and he went to a makeup store and bought a bunch of makeup for himself. And he came back, and he was like, show me how to use it. And then he just started doing his own makeup and doing a really great job. So, so, so we were painted and he was painted. And I was painting everyone, actually. I was doing um, Spencer's face and I was doing Brendan's face, too. And so we were all painted and we looked out in the audience and we saw our first two people with their faces painted. And all of us, when we came off stage that day, were like, oh, my God, it's happened. Even though Panic were selling out shows every night and playing to hordes of screaming fans, they were still just four friends hanging out. The boys themselves, they're, they're just they're just really silly guys. And um, <clears throat> um, like Brendan was this huge nut and, uh, and John was just this, this, this uh, he, he just was a prankster. And uh, all of them were, were just had this, Ryan would surprise you sometimes with his, with his humor because he was really quiet and, and reserved and all of a sudden he would just come out with something and you're just like, what? They would also have this, this game that they would play called CeeLo where they would do this gambling game and, and they would roll the dice and, and depending on what um, numbers you get, they would be betting like real money and they would lose thousands of dollars with each other. Um, yeah, and um, I remember uh, <coughs> John would get so upset <laughs> uh, and uh, because he lost so much money and then Ryan would get so upset because he lost so much money. And, and they just had this, this great camaraderie with each other. You can even see it in, in, in some of their interviews uh, um, where th they're just kind of just laughing and, and, and uh, yeah, they, they take their music seriously and they take um, all these things about them seriously, but boy, they're, they're, they're just nuts. <laughs> One strange occurrence on tour was this mysterious stinky shoe that kept showing up under pillows on the tour bus. <laughs> And we're still not sure who was responsible, but I think it was one of the guys. <laughs> News came that the video for I Write Sins, Not Tragedies had been nominated in five categories at the 2006 MTV Video Music Awards, including the prestigious Video of the Year, which they won. The win ensured heavy MTV rotation of their future videos, but it's better if you do, Lying is the most fun, and build God, then we'll talk. No one ever could have predicted that we would have gotten nominated for a VMA for this, let alone the biggest one, you know, Video of the Year. That was certainly not in the, you know, in the plans. Uh, when we first heard about the nomination, well, the nominations, which was shocking, we, we, like I said, we were just flabbergasted. I mean, the fact that we got nominated for five categories for a new artist and, you know, had never been a VMA nominee before, you know, no, no, no video I had ever made had been nominated for anything. It was just a very surreal, you know, notion. Sitting through the VMAs uh, was really cool, but it was, it was kind of discouraging in a weird, bizarre way. I mean, here we were nominated for five awards and we had basically lost four of them, which 
you know, we, there was a couple that we thought, oh, this, is, this has got to be a shoe in just because of the nature of them being a new artist, whatever. And we'd lost those. And, uh, and so we'd gone from being shocked that we were even nominated to kind of being angry that we hadn't won, which is, you know, perhaps a bit arrogant, but I think understandable. This is an award that's reserved for, you know, Christina Aguilera's, Madonna's, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, the kind of artists that we were up against. It's like that, those, those are the artists that win this award. It really wasn't even a consideration that we might win this one. So we decided to go hit the after parties early. And uh, when we got outside of the venue, the rest of our party hadn't come out yet. And they called and said, yeah, you know, we're actually gonna stay inside. And we're like, what? So we went back around, had to go show our identification to get back into the venue. By the time we got in there, uh, a friend of mine said, hey, Shane, congratulations, man. And I'm, I looked at him, I'm like, for what were you talking about? We lost, man, we lost all these awards. And he's like, you just won video of the year. And, I'm, and I thought for a minute that he was just being really cruel. And, I, and then I looked at him and I knew that, you know, by his smile, he was serious. And I flipped out, you know, I, I, to me, it, you know, this was the Academy Award for Best Picture as far as music videos goes. Panic completed their last tour, entitled Nothing Rhymes With Circus, at the end of 2006. Thoughts now turn to writing the second album. Because this is their sophomore album, and it could... You know, if it dives, it dives, and that's your sophomore slump, and it's really hard to recover from a sophomore slump. So it's going to be really interesting to see if they're able to just keep steamrolling it. If they go a different direction, do they keep doing what they're doing? I'm really interested to hear what they end up, you know, what they have in store. They have a lot of pressure on them. They've got a platinum album out there. They've got millions of fans around the world, and they have a new album coming up. I don't know how much... Um pressure is being put on them from outside and I don't know how much pressure they're putting on themselves right now but if they can let all of that go and just make their art Ryan is an incredible writer so if he can stay in present to himself and just write I think the album will be brilliant but I'm sure that the new record is gonna be a lot more like the last song on the record with the cellos and the strings and everything. I'm sure it's going to be a lot, I'm sure it's going to be a great record. I think their next album is going to be huge for sure. I mean, this is just um, the first step I think in their career and and uh, after 160 shows and touring the world, they got a lot more to to, to say, you know. It's right on that verge where um, you know, the innocence, it's kind of there's kind of losing it a little bit just because they've been around so much but they haven't completely lost it so I think this is the perfect time for a great album. I think they can write another incredible album and I think it'll be completely different. I expect it to be completely completely different. The success of Panic at the Disco put the spotlight on Las Vegas and the wealth of talent in the music scene. Many felt this would enable the city of sin to carve out a new image. The music scene in Vegas was really awful a couple of years ago. It started to pick up steam because you have the killers, you have Panic at the Disco came in and Panic at the Disco kind of really opened up the floodgates. Labels now are actually looking in Las Vegas as opposed to just never, before you, there was no one here. You had to go have a meeting in LA or go try to pool someone from another city to come to your show in Vegas. Panic of the Disco has now become sort of like an icon of Las Vegas in a lot of ways. So. I don't think I've ever seen a band go, you know, as, as fast and as far as they've gone in such a short period of time. I mean, it's unheard of to be two sold out shows at Madison Square Garden within your first year of, of touring, you know, putting a band together. I think it's just like the technology and the, and the youth it kind of all met at a perfect time for them. Um, you know, they're that one in a million band. A lot of people wrote them off saying, yeah, they're not going to go anywhere, you know, they got signed, it's happened before, they're done. But then they blew up. And, you know, next thing you know, they're on MTV, next thing you know, they're going platinum. I didn't realize how big we were, honestly, until it was like I was out of the band. When I saw it from an outside view, I was like, holy shit. Because when I was in the band, I didn't have like this idea that we were this huge rock band. I was just like, we were in a band, you know? 
I still saw it as that. And then when the once I was out of the band, I was like, wow, because you know, I wasn't on tour. I wasn't in that life every day. I didn't see it. And then I come home and I see the video on every five seconds. And like I'll walk into the bank and it, the song's on, or I'll go into Porta Subs to get a sandwich, and it's like everywhere. It's it's really it was really mind blowing for me. Everyone in Las Vegas is surprised at their popularity. I don't think anyone thought they would get as big as they did, and their success isn't a testament to how the city has kind of ridden them off, you know, and wrote them off initially, and to an extent writes them off to this day. But their success just kind of flies in that, and you know, that's good for them. It's good that they can break apart from kind of the negativity that surrounds the local music scene to be one of the most successful bands in America right now. Vegas has an entirely different image. It's no longer the place where rock stars go to die. It's where they come to create a career. Panic at the Disco's accelerated rise to fame, their youth, image, and musical direction has provoked much discussion and controversy. With a new album just around the corner, the future looks positive for Panic at the Disco. You know, once you're big and once you're hot, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to stay up there, I think, and it's, it's kind of, um, especially being so young and having so much potential and energy and everything, um, a lot of kids are, you know, they're, they're into it, and that this is kind of what's selling right now, and um, I think that, that they'll be around for a while. I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know. I know I've heard different things with, with member changes and everything, but they, they have kind of stuck to it, and, um, you know, they have the kind of dedication that it takes to stay with it. The interesting thing to see now will be how they handle the pressure of this massive amount of fame that has literally come in one year. It's, it's, it's one year. If their first year of doing what they do is any um, you know, indication of, of what's to come for them, um, they've got some great stories ahead of them. Some, you know, uh, some, they've had some amazing things happen to them already. So even if it went no further, even if the band decided tomorrow, this is it, they're breaking up. They've achieved some things that other bands who have worked 20, 30 years trying to do will never achieve. But there's not to say that you wouldn't want to keep trying to, uh, to improve on, on what you've done before, right? Keep challenging yourself and doing better. So being with them and watching how effortlessly everything happens for them, it's effortless. It really is being around them because they're not working it. They're not. They're just desiring and saying yes when it arrives. I really believe that they have something in the music based on who they are as people that is timeless. And I think they're gonna continue to bring that more and more. I didn't see them kind of uh, affected by the fame in a negative way. I feel like it only made them go deeper into themselves and step up to the plate and say, we are gonna bring something really good the next time around. And they're hard workers, they are hard workers. That is one like really thing that I respected about them a lot is they didn't slack off. They, you know, Brendan would be doing his vocal warm ups every night before the show, hardcore. You know, Ryan was spending time thinking about lyrics and coming up with ideas for the next thing. And Spencer was always, you know, it was like a very strong work ethic. So with their artistic sensibilities and the work ethic involved and their good hearts, I don't think they can go wrong. From the time that they uh, came into the studio, um, they're musicianship and their showmanship had grown exponentially to, to a level that is just unbelievable. I think they did something different. They did something that not a lot, not a lot of people really had the guts to do because it just seems kind of odd to stick some of the things they did together because they went dance and a lot of people are like well that's that's looked down upon in rock because now you you know you're weak you're not like rock and uh, you know he went full out pop, and but still kept rock elements. Thinking of them in the studio, you know, playing around, you would kind of hear like bits and pieces of songs, and then they'd stop, and you'd hear the keyboard stuff, some of their intros going on, and they were kind of piecing things together. And uh, but then to hear the complete recording, and to see them progress to the Orleans, you know, and Madison Square Garden, and all that stuff, and and to to turn the TV on New Year's Eve and they were playing on the Carson Daly show, that's huge. A lot of the bands that have knocked them, you know, for their success or their, you know, lack of paying their dues or whatever, a lot of bands that have paid their dues have now sort of ripped off some of the stuff they're doing, which to me is, is brilliant, you know? I think that that is, 
that's justice. You know, at the end of the day, you know, they sold records, they did what they wanted to do, and they're and they're having a good time doing it. I mean, I don't I don't know what you can knock about that.